today. Are you well? We just sang about it, so hopefully you didn't lie. Hopefully it is well with you. Uh, we got an extra hour of sleep. You look rested and good. How many know that's from God? Every good gift comes from the Lord. I could take an extra hour every week. That would be awesome. Um, I don't know if you know this, but the first song we sang from the inside out, there was like five songs that I learned when I first became a believer, and I say that I got saved on them. That was one of them, and I didn't know we were playing that today, and again, I'm already emotional, and I haven't even preached anything yet, so it's going to be an interesting day, um, but that's an oldie and a goodie, and I uh, hope it was good for you. Today, I'm really fired up and excited. We are actually continuing the series that we started last week that's really been heavy on my heart. I've been waiting like five months to do the series, and it's called The Forgotten Ways, and really what the whole series is all about is it's a call back for us as Christians and as the church to that which makes us distinct, that there are ways of thinking, there's behaviors that are essential to the Christian life, and they're just being forgotten. And not just in culture, but right now in the church culture, I've been saying for weeks that ministry is changing in America and it's happening fast. 10 years ago, ministry was different, I think. I think old time preachers had it easier. They used to just tell people stuff and people would say, why? And they'd say, because God said so. <laughs> That's in the Bible. And that used to hold water and it used to hold a lot more weight. And today we live in a so what culture. So what? The, the Bible says that. I need you to prove to me that that's actually relevant for my life. I need you to show me that that's actually going to help me. And all of a sudden we start picking and choosing things, even in scripture, even what God lays out for us. And we're not really living captivated where God has the whole thing. When we started the church, that's what we said the word captivate means. When I found Jesus, that's what happened to me. I got captivated. He took the whole thing. He didn't want part of my life. He didn't want to be a category in my life. He wanted to be the center of my life. In fact, I'll say it like this. A life with Jesus will never satisfy as long as he is an accessory to your life rather than the entirety of your life. Jesus doesn't do very well as a piece of wall decor in the entry room of our Pinterest house. It doesn't, it doesn't go over very well. Jesus wants the whole thing in our life. In fact, I'm really excited in January, we're going to start going through the book of Acts chapter and verse. And I'm excited for it for several reasons. One reason is because we're going to study about and read about people who are so fired up about their faith, they're willing to get beaten and arrested for it. And as I was thinking about that this week, I was just thinking about how you know, for a lot of the church today, if we got arrested for being a Christian, there would not be enough evidence to convict us because we look like everybody else. And there's just as much worry and anxiety about the nightly news that we have from everybody else. It would be like the most boring CSI episode of all time. You got arrested and they're like, was there a conviction? There was no evidence actually. So they didn't actually go to jail um, because it, our life doesn't show anything that is different. I think there's a pull and a pressure to live like that, to just be normal and be like everybody else. And we don't see that in the Bible that You know, anybody that really followed Jesus in the Bible had a normal life. And a lot of it, I think, is for the sake of being relevant. And I talked about this last week. I think it's a big problem in church and a big problem even with leaders in the church that we're so concerned on being relevant to culture. And I think that's important. I think the gospel is relevant by itself (laughs) right now. I think it addresses every issue, every person, every problem that's in our life. And I want to preach a relevant message that it's actually useful for your life. But sometimes it becomes greater than our reverence for God, just trying to be relevant or normal in culture. In fact, I'll say like this, staying reverent, deep admiration for God and all we do will make us distinct, but just trying to stay relevant can make us extinct. We're not the salt of the earth anymore. We're not really the church that God intended for us to be. The truth is there are things, customs that are so central to humanity in 2021, and they just don't have anything to do with God. And when they get into your life, it squeezes out the presence and love of God. That's what John says. First John 2, verse 15, he says this, don't love the world's ways. Don't love the world's goods. The love of the world squeezes out the love of the Father. Practically everything that goes on in the world, wanting your own way, wanting everything for yourself, wanting to appear important, that's tough. (laughs) One of those probably landed for you, hopefully. It has nothing to do with God. It has nothing to do with the Father. It just isolates you from him. The world and all its wanting, 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 it's on the way out. But whoever does what God wants is set for eternity, and I would even say for today. Now, is, is John just being a grumpy old man? Um, no, he's not yelling at you, telling you to get rid of your Disney Plus. I hope you, you don't read it that way, all right? What he's actually saying is there's a better way. And it's, it's a really challenging aspect of the Christian life, but it's necessary, and it's this. We need to learn how to fall in love with the world, but not fall in love with its ways. And that's what Jesus did. Jesus showed up, and he loved the world so much, he became nothing like it. <laughs> not to one-up or be better than or to lord over, but rather to show a different way. I don't know if you ever feel that way if you read news or you watch the Twitter and you're like, we need a different way. (laughs) We could use some leaders that show us a different example. That's what Jesus came to do. That's what our job is, but we cannot do it without God's ways, like waiting on the Spirit and reverence. And last week I talked about friendship with God. 
and hosting the presence of God and the Holy Spirit everywhere we go. Honor, humility, purity, Sabbath. In fact, today I get to talk about that. Today I get to talk about the forgotten way of Sabbath. Sabbath. And I'm really excited to talk about it because I think we have it backwards in our culture. In fact, I'll say it like this. We work so that we can rest when God made us to rest so that we can work. It's the opposite of how we think, but we're going to see it in Scripture today. I think we see it in culture. We, we live in the safest time ever for young people to grow up. What I mean by that is we have more access to good medicine, good doctors, good information, and yet statistics show that young people are more anxious than in any time in recorded history by far. What does that mean? What that means is there is something about the modern life that is not conducive for human flourishing. I don't think that our fast pace actually leads to the restoration of our soul. And I don't think I need to give you statistics to prove that to you or show you that. You probably experienced that in your own life. But I will say this. I read an article this last week about a new word that was formed in Japan for their language. And it was formed recently because of something that keeps happening over and over again that's brand new in their culture in the last 10 years. And this word is kuroshi. Kuroshi. Kuroshi, by the way, I don't know if I'm saying that right, all right? If you're a Japanese expert, I would like a grade on my pronunciation after service. But I read about it, and it's this word called Kuroshi, and it's describing a certain level of workaholism, all right? They described this one guy in their country who worked for a major tech company, and he worked for five years in a row. He worked 100 hours a week, and at the end of the five years, they found him dead at his desk, all right? That's a company man right there. They found him dead at his desk. He had a heart attack. He was 32 years old. And apparently this happens so often. <laughs> They're like, we've never heard of this before. It's a new thing. They had to create a new word in their language. They've now done it in China and South Korea. Created a word for something brand new. Where you work yourself to death. That's actually what the word kuroshi means. It's overworked death. It's working insane hours under intense pressure with little to no rest. I'm going to say it again. Working insane hours under intense pressure with little to no rest. Some of you are like, yeah, that's life. <laughs> or that's my life, right? Whether it be work or kids or school or whatever. And so the question for today is, God, do you have an answer and do you have a remedy for this? The answer is yes, it's called Sabbath. It's a day of complete rest. And God actually models this in the creation story, Genesis 2, which I'm gonna read about in a minute. And it brings up a very interesting theological conundrum. Why does the God who never tires take a rest? Because he doesn't need to, and yet he chooses to anyway. I'm going to talk about that in a minute. But what I want to first read is the first moment in the Bible when Sabbath is commanded to us. And it's not even the Ten Commandments. I'm going to read that also in a minute. It was right before that. It's going to be in Exodus 16 is what I'm about to read. It's also going to be up on the screen. Exodus 16. The Israelites have been in the wilderness for just a couple weeks, right? They exited Egypt. God set them free from slavery. And they go to a land that there's no food or like anything and so God has to provide for them every single day because they found themselves in a season of lack. By the way, we'll all have seasons like that in your life where you have lack so you can learn to rely on God. That's a different message. But here's what the Bible says, Exodus 16, verse 22. And so it was on the sixth day that they gathered twice as much bread, two omers for each one. And all the rulers of the congregation came and told Moses. Then he said to them, this is what the Lord has said. Tomorrow is a Sabbath rest a holy or set-apart Sabbath to the Lord. Bake what you'll bake today. Boil what you'll boil today, all that remains to be kept until morning. So they laid it up until morning as Moses commanded, and it did not stink, and there were not worms in it. So that would happen a lot. God said, you can take enough bread or manna for today, and if you take extra, it's gonna go bad because I haven't commanded you to do that. You need to learn how to actually trust in me. Jesus references this in the sermon uh, the, Lord's, uh, the Lord's Prayer in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 6, he said, Lord, give us today our daily bread. He's actually referencing Exodus 16, where we actually learn how to trust the Lord. Now, of course, people would not listen to God, <laughs> and they would take extra. And sometimes we do that. God, God has given you bread to eat. He's also given you bread to give away. And what this is saying is when you keep that which God has called you to give, he will not bless it. He will not bless it. Again, that's a different message for a different day. Verse 25, then Moses said, Eat that today, for today is a Sabbath to the Lord. Today you will not find it in the field. Like God is so serious about rest, he's saying if you work on that day, you're on your own. I'm not helping you out. You can still try, but I won't be there. You're disobeying me. Verse 26, six days you shall gather it, but on the seventh day, the Sabbath, there will be none. Now it happened that some of the people went out on the seventh day, and they just gathered it up anyway, because sometimes we just do that. But they found none. And the Lord said to Moses, how long will you refuse my 
commandments and my laws. He hasn't even given the 10 commandments yet. Verse 29, see, for the Lord has given you the Sabbath, which is to say it's a gift. Therefore, he gives it to you on the sixth day, bread for two days. Let every man, that word is really human, let every person remain in his place. Let no man go out of this place on the seventh day. Why? Why does he want you to rest? So that you can enjoy life, all right? I got four points on Sabbath. Here's the first one. Um, Sabbath is a commandment. Sabbath is a commandment. God commands us to rest. And we're going to read about it in Exodus 20. A couple chapters later, he gives the Ten Commandments. And before we read it, I think it's interesting to note that this commandment, the fourth one, to remember the Sabbath, is the longest one in the Bible. God takes the most time to explain this one, which is very interesting. If you, and you can see that with your eyes. Most of these commandments in this text are one verse. This one's three. God takes more time. Now, I don't think that is to say that it's more important than you shall have no other gods before me or you shall not kill I don't think that, but what I think is that perhaps God knew that when he said do not kill, he'd be like, that makes sense, but he knew he'd have a really hard time with the resting one, like that one's optional, and so God took a little bit extra time. Why? Because God knows what we're going through, right? It's like Jesus in the gospel. He talks about money way more than he talks about anything else. Now, does that mean that money's the most important thing to Jesus? No, 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 but he knows that it's often the most important thing to us, and so he speaks to it directly because he knows what we're going through. And I think it, it is to say that it's amazing how we don't read scripture as much as it reads us. Have you ever read the Bible and you're like, how did it know? <laughs> how did it know I needed to hear that? How did it know that you know, that's what I needed to be challenged on? That's what I was going through? It knows. God knows. God knows what we're going through. God knew 3,300 years ago that in 2021 when he says, do not kill, we're like, duh, that makes sense. But then when he says rest, we're like, no, nah, I don't know. That one's optional. He, he knew that we would feel that way and we would think that way. And so he makes it a command. We're going to read about it now. Exodus 20 and verse 8 says this. Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. <laughs> and, and please know that that word holy is not some big churchy word. All right? It's not. It just means set apart. And, it, and set apart in such a way where you can't have it because I've set it over here. It's not for you. For, for all that God has called us to give, the word holy is really about keeping. I'm keeping my body. It's not yours, it's God's. I'm keeping my time. I'm keeping part of my money. It's holy, it's set apart. In other words, I've taken it out of circulation, right? It's like my wife. I, I love my wife. Um, you can't ask her out on a date, all right? You can ask any other woman out on a date. You can't ask her, her out on a date because I took her out of circulation. She is holy to me and she's set apart. Or it's like if you have a roommate and you have your favorite mug and you're like, don't touch my mug, it's holy, right? My Mickey Mouse wide mouth mug is holy. If you touch it, feel my wrath, all right? It's set apart, it's out of circulation. I've kept it for myself, it's holy, it's not yours. That's what the word holy means, right? And so often people are like, yeah, but everybody's doing it and everybody's watching it and everybody, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. You have to ask yourself in your own life, what is holy to God in your life? Yeah, but everybody's watching it, but are your eyes holy? Is your body holy? What in your life is set apart just for God? What day of the week is what we're talking about today, but what part of your finances, what part of your gifting, what part of your body, what is set apart for the Lord? And it doesn't matter what everybody else is doing. That's the problem. That's why we're talking about this series. What is actually set apart? You're keeping it for him. Six days, you shall labor and do all of your emails, all right? Do all of your DM slide in. No, don't do that. I heard that's a bad thing. Don't actually do that. Do, do all your work, all right, verse 10. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall turn off your phone. My wife said, hallelujah, Jesus. This message is for me. But he says what? Do not work. It's a commandment. And the interesting thing about this for me is this made God's top 10 list. <laughs> like it's on the same list and it bears the same weight as don't kill, don't steal, don't commit adultery. Don't covet, that's crazy to me. Don't work, nor your son, your daughter, your male servant, your female servant, nor your cows. It's like, I don't even want your cows working. Nor your stranger who's within your gates. For in six days, the Lord has made the heavens and the, and the earth and the sea and all that's in it. And he rested, which is interesting. I'll talk about it in a minute. He rested on the seventh day. Therefore, the Lord has blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. The word hallowed comes from the same root word as holy. It just means he set it apart and he made it holy. So God makes this a commandment. It's on his top 10. And yet most people in church think, I'm going to do everything I can not to violate the other nine, but this one is kind of optional. <laughs> and it's just not a right way of thinking. Now, there might be some people that think, um, didn't Jesus save us from all these commandments? <laughs> Why are we even talking about them? And that's true. Because of what Jesus did on the cross, we are no longer required to do all these things to make it 
into heaven, praise the Lord, but he doesn't want us to ignore it. I'll say it like this. We don't follow the 10 commandments to gain life for eternity. Jesus did that. We follow them to gain life for today, to be blessed for today. If you ignore it, that's actually really bad for you. We understand that there are very clear consequences in not following the other nine. What we don't often see is the consequences of not following this one. And it's very, very real. God made this thing to stop. That's what he made. In fact, it comes from a Hebrew word, Sabbath, it's the word Shabbat, and it means to stop or to cease. And God made us that way to actually stop. When I was younger, I used to think, I'm going to take a Sabbath and I'm going to go to Disneyland. It's like, yo, that's not stopping. You know, like that's amusing, but it's not stopping. You ever know, like you ever go on a vacation where what I'm noticing, we go on a trip and then we need one day of rest in between before we come back into real life. You ever, you ever do that? How many know that that, it's, that indicates that wasn't very restful, whatever you did, right? Five days at Disneyland, and then I need a rest day so that I can go back to work. <laughs> it's like rest in between my rest. It's probably not rest. It's something else. It's amusement. Anyway, resting is necessary. It's necessary. It's kind of like your iPhone. Does anybody in here not have an iPhone? Anybody not have an iPhone? We'll pray for you. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, you're probably smarter than we are. But uh, this thing is amazing, all right? And uh, we shouldn't even call it a phone anymore because it's not really, that's not what you use it mostly for, right? It's like your own virtual personal assistant, encyclopedia life coach, whatever. In fact, the other day, uh, my friend was like, oh, I got to get a new phone. It's terrible. Can you believe they're like $800 now? I'm like, that's it? This thing's worth like 20 grand to me, man. Like, imagine not having it, all right? Most of my life and my work is actually on it. But imagine for a moment that your phone dies, which is terrible and you have no charge, and for some reason, you can't find a charger, you can't buy one, supply chain problem, we blame COVID, obviously, right? You can't get a charger anywhere, and in my hypothetical, nobody will share theirs with you, it's holy, it's set apart, you can't have it, right? You don't go to this church in my hypothetical, you go to some other church, we would share ours with you, no, no problem, um, but you have no charge. What is this thing worth to you now with no charge? What is it even used for? Is it a coaster? I don't know. Is it self-defense? It's got some weight to it. You could hit someone, especially if you have one of those otter box cases where they get three times bigger. Do you ever have a case like that? I'm like, what are you driving cars over it? Like, what, why, why do we have a case that big? Anyway, what is, it, what is it actually used for? It's not really used for much. And, and we're often the same way. You're an amazing person, but with no charge, you're not at your best. I'll never forget when God told me that uh, a few years ago. Uh, me and Monica were having a hard week. You were acting crazy. It's fine. I prayed. <laughs> God, she's crazy, help. That was the whole prayer, whatever. And I remember the Lord saying, she's like your iPhone. She's amazing. She does everything for you. You probably would starve if she wasn't around. She, she loves you and she does all this stuff for you. But without a charge, she's not at her best. I had just been traveling a lot the last couple of weeks for work and she hadn't had a real rest. And I remember thinking that she's not at her best. She does not have a charge. Why would I expect more from her? That doesn't make any sense. I, I wouldn't have my phone if it was... Dead. Sometimes we get glitchy like our phone. I don't know if you ever have a glitchy phone. It's the worst. I remember I called my friend the other day because I don't know anything about technology. And so I had to call someone who does. And one of my best friends really tech savvy. I said, my phone's glitchy. It won't load stuff. It's laggy. It's the worst. I need a new part. I need a new phone. I need new fluid. I don't know stuff about phones. And, and he literally asked me this question. He said, when's the last time you turned it off? I thought, I, I don't know. 2008? Like, I didn't know, I didn't know phones turn off. Did, did you know they turn off? I didn't know that. I don't even know how to turn it off. You told me the other day to turn it off, and I held the button, and nothing happened. You're like, you have to hold these two buttons. I'm like, I didn't know that. I didn't even know how to turn it off. And he said, just turn it off real quick. Give it a break, and then turn it back on. And it was like a bona fide miracle. It was crazy. I, I turned it back on, and it worked. It needed a little bit of a rest. It needed a little bit of a reset. And that's actually exactly what we need. The way that God has designed you is when you don't rest, you suffer. You suffer physically, you suffer mentally, people have mental breakdown. You suffer relationally in your life, and sometimes we get so exhausted, we get at the very end of ourselves, and we like, we're like, God, why are you doing this to me? And God sometimes has to look at us and say, oh no, I'm not doing this to you, you are doing this to you. I tried to give you a gift called Sabbath, in fact, that's point number two, Sabbath is a gift. It's a gift. Like God made the seven-day work week. He could have made it 10. He could have made it 20. He made it seven. And when he did, he threw in a rest day for us. That's what Jesus says, Mark 2, 27. Then Jesus said to them, the Sabbath was made to meet the needs of the people, not the people to meet the requirements of the Sabbath. The Pharisees are walking around, and they're just beating people with the Sabbath and with the law. 
judging them, making them feel condemned because they're not following it to a T. And Jesus is like, that's not really what this whole thing's about. <laughs> this is actually for you. You actually need it. God didn't make us to serve the Sabbath. He made the Sabbath to serve us. Now, it's a gift. He commands it. We should not ignore it. We should absolutely listen to it. But it's not a condemnation or a legalistic thing because of what Jesus did on the cross. It's not meant to be a burden. It's meant to be a blessing. Like some of you are really behind on rest. And sometimes we feel guilty for that. God, I owe you. And God's like, no, you owe you. <laughs> you might be 17 days behind. And God's like, you need a rest. Now, it's not a legalistic thing. Like I said, even Luke 14, 5, Jesus says, if your ox falls into a ditch on the Sabbath, just pull it out. All right? This is getting weird. It's, it shouldn't be legalistic. All right? Treat your, we all love our ox. Treat your ox well. All right? Don't just leave it in there. That'd be weird. That's not what this thing's about. And the problem is the Pharisees would follow them around. They like to follow Jesus around, and they would watch him do stuff. Like he'd heal people on the Sabbath, and they would just start throwing penalty flags, and that's 15 yards, Jesus. You don't do that on the Sabbath, and they would freak out. And Jesus has to look at them and say, you don't really know what this thing is about. You do not understand. And then he looks at them, Matthew 12, 8, and he says, I'm the Lord of the Sabbath. And what he's saying there is this is actually about me and my people. Me healing people on the Sabbath is what Sabbath is all about. And what he's doing is he's referencing what's happening here in Exodus, that the Sabbath was a reminder to the Israelites that when you couldn't provide for you, I provided for you. And what the Sabbath is for us today is a reminder that when we couldn't save ourselves, Jesus saved us. I'm sorry, on that Saturday after Good Friday when Jesus went to our cross for us, what were the disciples doing? They were in a house resting, doing nothing. Jesus was working. Meaning what? When, when we cannot save ourselves, Jesus was at work saving us. He did it for us. And a, and a Sabbath is a reminder of that. And that's why, honestly, that's why much of the church we celebrate on Sunday. A lot of people ask, isn't the Shabbat, isn't Sabbath in, in orthodoxy culture, isn't it on Saturday? Why don't we celebrate on the correct day? And it was true. In Hebrew culture, they celebrated the Sabbath on, on Saturday. And that was true in their culture. We celebrate on Sunday because Jesus rose from the dead on, on Sunday. We celebrate Jesus on Sunday, the first day of the week. Now, Romans 14 clears all this up, by the way. I had somebody ask me that the other day. They said, we're on the wrong day. And I'm like, Romans 14 says, don't matter which day you celebrate. You can enter into the Lord's rest today, tomorrow, the next day. As long as you do it in honor of the Lord, it doesn't matter. So, so there were Gentiles years ago that were like, do we got to do it on Saturday, though? You know, because we got college football and I work and all this kind of stuff. Do we have to do it on Saturday? And they're like, no, just do it to honor the Lord. And so they made a decision. Let's do it on Sunday when Jesus raised from the dead. Let's get all our friends together and let's celebrate the fact that Jesus died for me and he's still alive. And I mean, oh, 2,000 years later, the party is still going. Here we are because Jesus is still alive. And that's what we do today on Sunday as the church. But we're not legalistic about it. Jesus says, if your ox falls in a ditch, pick it up. Now, if your ox falls in a ditch every week, there's something wrong with you. Like, you're not stewarding your life very well. Sometimes we know people, they're, they're always rallying, and they're always in a hurry. That's tiring. Something's wrong, right? Our ox shouldn't fall in a ditch every week. That's bad management of our life, right? Don't make that, don't make that the goal. It's time for something to change. But it's not a rule. It's a gift. In fact, I'll say this. Sabbath is no longer a rule, but it is a rhythm, it's a rhythm. God wove Sabbath into the rhythm of creation. And I'm going to talk about that now for just a minute. But it won't, won't happen if it's not on your calendar, all right? That's what I mean by rhythm. If it's not on my calendar, I don't do it. If it's important, it needs to go on there. Because rhythm creates depth. And that's point number three. Sabbath creates depth. Sabbath creates depth where we stop and think about our life and reflect on it. I'm going to use a music illustration, which is funny because I auditioned for the worship team here at church and nobody called me back. I don't know why. All right. I'm not the singing guy. And so I became the talking guy. Know your, know your role. Know what you're good at. I'm a one string guitar, whatever. But I'm going to use a music example. It's like drums. All right. So my son Levi is four. And if he played the drums today instead of Ricky, who's awesome. All right. If he came, my son, he would play it like this. And it would be nonstop. And he would have that face too, right? He'd be like, like my son, if he was in a band, would be in a screamo, like punk rock. That's who he is. He's crazy. And he would just play it nonstop. And if he did that, he'd make noise. And it wouldn't be good noise, right? But if you actually want to make rhythm in music, it requires something called a rest. I'll say this. Good rhythm comes from a good rest. I heard a pastor say it like this, that we'd have better days if we'd have better nights, if we learned how to rest. And I'll say, you'd have a better week if you had a better Sabbath or we slow down. And God actually models this in Genesis 2. 
And again, it's that question of why does a God who never gets tired, Isaiah 40, verse 8 said he never grows weary, he doesn't need to rest, he chooses to take one anyway. Why? Well, Exodus 31 reflects on this, verse 17, it says this, it is a sign, speaking of the Sabbath, it's a sign forever between me and my people, right, which is to say Sabbath is also a witness to people, that's another point we didn't have time for. It's a sign between me and my people of Israel that in six days the Lord made heaven and earth and on the seventh day he rested and he was refreshed. Here's a new word, refreshed. That's a very interesting word. Again, why does a God who doesn't need a refreshment, he doesn't need a cold Gatorade Zero, why does he need to get refreshed? Well, this word refreshed comes from a Hebrew word that means to inhale, to breathe in, which was different than what God was doing the previous six days. In six days, God created, and when God creates, he actually speaks. And when you speak, you exhale. The Bible says God breathed life into Adam. By the way, that's why the Bible says there's life and death in the tongue. God creates with his mouth. You often create the world or atmosphere you live in with your mouth. That's a different message, all right? But God exhaled for six days. For six days, the focus was on exhaling. And for the seventh day, the focus was on inhaling. I don't know if you've ever thought to yourself, man, I just need to catch my breath in life. <laughs> you would, if you take a Sabbath, it's amazing how much more we enjoy life and think about it and reflect and soak it in when we stop. That's what God was doing. He was enjoying what he made and he was soaking it all in and he was reflecting on it and it refreshed him. For me, uh, my, I don't think we realize how much our minds need rest. Sometimes I'm so not creative or I can't even think very critically when I haven't rested because my mind is racing. Um, and maybe there were days where you're like, man, I used to be more creative and I was innovative, and I was tougher, and it's like, I'm just so tired, I can't even think. It's a very real thing. And some of you, it's like, used to be romantic. <laughs> some, it's not until like day four or five on vacation that my wife's like, you're back! Like, this is the real you. And I'm like, dang, if it takes five days on vacation for the real you to come back, there's something about your rhythm that's unhealthy. And I think that's true for a lot of us, though. God wove Sabbath into the rhythm of creation, we were meant to work then rest, go forward and then stop, and we experienced that as a church. A lot of you weren't here before COVID, but what we're experiencing now happened before. We had four services before COVID, and with all these people showing up and we're trying to create community fast, it was almost like if we grow any faster, this is gonna be a problem because we can't create community that fast with small groups and all this kind of stuff. And we were just running as fast as we could, and we had already lined up all these new things, and then we all got stopped, <laughs> and I didn't like it. I don't know if you liked it, but I didn't like it. And we, and we got stopped. God put us on a global timeout. He pulled the Psalm 23 on us, which says this. He makes me lie down in green pastures. I don't know if you've ever noticed that. David's like, it wasn't optional. He had to make me do it. I didn't want to lay down. He actually made me lay down. How many know that last year wasn't optional? David said it wasn't optional. We were made to lie down. That's hard. Sometimes that's life. I know in life, you either stop or get stopped. We don't often break the rules of life. They often break us. We have to choose to stop. And if you're like me, I don't like to stop. <laughs> I like to go really fast. But it's actually good for us to do why. It's what the next verse says, so that he can restore my soul. There's something about stopping and restoration that goes together. I'll say it like this. Soul healing often requires your feet stopping. Stopping. And sometimes we don't like that. Because if I stop, then I'm gonna have to look at my issues and the things in my life that might need fixing and I don't really wanna think about that. I'm just gonna keep running. If I can put four more things on my calendar, then I'll feel like I'm somebody and I don't have to deal with the fact that my identity is rooted in something else. Which I'm just gonna keep going. I don't really wanna slow down. I don't wanna think about the people I need to forgive and that I need to reach out to. No thanks, I'm just gonna keep running. And the Bible is teaching us if you do that, you will kill yourself. Physically, mentally, spiritually, relationally, that's how people have breakdowns. In fact, I'll say this, you can choose to have many small breaks or one very large breakdown. And that's what happens in life and these are the options. And so as much as I hated the global timeout that God allowed us to be on, it did a lot of good things. I think as a church, we're deeper. Our future has a lot more clarity to it. And there was a lot of refreshing that went on because we had to slow down. And I'll say this, and I wish I could talk about this for another 20 minutes. Speed is the enemy of depth. That's why we have a, a lot of, a lack of deep people and conversations in the world today. <laughs> we have a lot of two second Insta, you know, conversations. That sometimes it's like four letters, a whole conversation, right? Sup, lit, peace, and it's over. And like, that's what a lot of, that's how a lot of people talk. And it's like, we don't know how to talk anymore. 
And God doesn't want that for you. The God who doesn't need to rest chose to take a rest so that he could slow down and have a relationship with us. And by the way, he wasn't in a hurry. He's still not in a hurry. He wants to have depth with us. And it's really hard because of point number four, I'm gonna end with this. Sabbath requires faith. Sabbath requires faith. It takes faith to recognize that six is greater than seven. And that's what Sabbath is all about. How is six greater than seven? That's not math I understand. I wasn't a math major, so I did ministry, whatever. And so that doesn't make any sense to me. How is six days with God's blessing? How can I get more done and go farther in life than I can with seven on my own life? I don't know, as Chick-fil-A seems to be working pretty well for them. <laughs> and I wish I could tell that whole story. A lot of you probably know it. But a guy named Chewett Cathy started a business a long time ago, and he said, we're not working on Sunday because we're going to praise the Lord. And that's why their chicken is anointed from God. It's like... <laughs> God gave manna and he gave an eight count nuggets, <laughs> Exodus 42. Um, and that's what I said earlier. It's a, he said it'll be a sign to other people of our, of our relationship. You say, no, I'm actually choosing to rest so I can spend time with God. And it's a faith thing. It's a faith thing to recognize when I couldn't save myself, Jesus saved me. And that's, that's supposed to be a weekly reminder to you on that day, which is perhaps why it's so hard because it's a faith thing. You know, a lot of us have a mental clock in our head of the life that we need to live. By 25 this, by 35 dream job, by 35 house, by 45 X amount of money, by 70 retirement. It's like, who gave you that clock? <laughs> I don't know. It wasn't from God. God's on a totally different clock. He's not on that clock. You know, it'd be kind of weird today if we had daylight savings and for some reason, because you don't have an iPhone or something, um, it missed you, and you were just an hour off everything today. It'd be a lot of weird things would happen to you in life, and that's what it's like for us. We're on the wrong clock, and life's confusing, and it's strange, and it's weird because we're not on God's clock that he created you. He breathed life into you, and he made you to rest and take a Sabbath, and one day we'll be in eternity, and that's what should be on your mind, the way that you live and, and steward all the things that you have. That's the clock the God's on, and we're often not on that clock. We're like, no, I can do this. I'm going to achieve my timeline. I'm the master of my own ship. I'm the commander of my own soul. And then every day we fall asleep and you get tired. <laughs> every day is a faith thing. Every day we're like, I I'm the master of my own ship, and then we fall asleep. And then God made the sun to come up and the moon, and the moon to come up and the sun to go down. Why? So he could put us to bed. He's like, okay, master of your own ship. It's time to go to bed now. You know? and, then, and then he puts us to bed. And he says, hey, when you're sleeping, I made you to sleep. I don't sleep. Psalm 121, God says, I don't ever sleep. I'm going to take care of all this. I'm going to keep making the earth move and the sun and all this kind of stuff. And you just need to trust that. I made you to rest. Every single day is about faith. When we're on God's clock, um, how do we enjoy life? It takes faith every single day. You know, i never forget when we came to start the church. A couple months before we started it, my mom said something to me that I'll never forget. She said, son, I think you're going to, you know, God's going to use you to help start a great church and people will show up and lives will be changed and all that. And I said, thanks, mom. That's great. She said, I'm not worried about that. I'm not worried it won't go well. She said, I'm worried you won't enjoy it because you don't know how to rest and you don't know how to slow down. And she was absolutely right. And it hit me hard. And I began to think about that. I like to go fast. I like to run as fast as I can. I like to do that. I like to achieve things. I like it. And in that moment, that whole story unraveled in my head and was like, that's not true, actually. It's not that I like to achieve a lot. It's not that I like to go fast. I feel like I have to because it's who I am. And this is how people know me. I'm supposed to achieve a lot. I'm supposed to go really fast. And if I don't do that, who am I? And I think that is often the motivation that drives our clock. It is actually creating the person that I really am. But Jesus wants us to know today that with God, my identity is not defined by my activity, but my eternity. It's not about what I do for me. It's about what Jesus does for me. It's about what Jesus did for me. And today I can rest in that alone, and it takes faith. I need a daily reminder of that, and I certainly need a weekly reminder of that. It's called Sabbath. And so in our house now, we take Friday. It's our Sabbath. And this last week, we're starting to do communion every Friday in our house, because we're like, how do we remember this? How do we teach ourselves and our kids that when I wasn't saving me, he was, and I need to rest in that? And so I'll just ask you, what does that look like for you in your life? 
to reflect and remember that every week. It's not about your activity, it's about your eternity. That's what defines you. That's who you are. What does that look like for you? Would you pray with me? Lord Jesus, thank you so much for modeling to us what it looks like to withdraw. Father, thank you for modeling to us what it looks like to take a rest, to soak it all in, to reflect on what you're doing in our life so it can actually take root. Again, speed is the enemy of depth where I just run on the surface my whole life. And I don't wanna live that way. I pray that that wouldn't be a sign of our church, that we'd actually reflect on your clock. Maybe I have five minutes to pray for someone. Maybe I have a day that I can carve out where I do no work. What do you do on the Sabbath? No, it's not about what you do, it's about what you do not do. It's holy. I do not do that. I do not run, I don't strive, I don't work. It's for the Lord. When I couldn't work for myself, he worked for me. I pray that would become part of our identity, Lord, that we would enter into your rest. Show us what that looks like for us on a weekly basis. Lord, we love you. Thank you for caring about us when we don't even care about us. Help us to rest in Jesus' name, amen.